Imagine a world where your machine learning features are part of your production pipeline. Can you see it? Now, humor me one more time and imagine that those machine learning features are not a scary monster that nobody wants to refactor. In today's industry, we seem to treat machine learning as though it's not software, as though it is some magical deity that doesn't need to comply to software engineering standards. We hear things like, you can't test machine learning because of its stochastic nature. Really? The whole pipeline? Or the engineer can do the production readiness things, like testing. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you on this, in this audience have at some point had to either test or explain a piece of code that you never wrote. It's hard. It's hard because you don't know the writer's intentions. You don't know if you have found a bug or a feature. As it turns out, we have the tools to help us with these kinds of problems. So let's talk about testing. When we think of testing within the machine learning context, we can think of it in the following pyramid. We have our unit tests at the bottom. Tons of unit tests, that's why it's the base. We have a lot of them. They're checking single functionality. Then we have our integration tests. There are less of them, that's why they're in the middle. But they check that everything can connect properly. And last, at the top, we have our ML validation. These are the least amount of tests, but arguably the most important. Because they check that our models work within the context that they're supposed to be working in. Let's dig a little bit deeper into each one of these. Unit tests are the kind of tests that you see in pretty much all software, unless you're being naughty. They're checking single functionality. For example, adding two numbers together. That's a single functionality. You have given a certain input. You know that when it's given to a certain function, you know what the expected output is. But why am I telling you this? I mean, we're talking about machine learning. Well, your entire data cleaning pipeline is a pipeline of expectations. We're doing things like replacing or formatting values. For example, replace all the empty values with the median. We're also creating features that are products of other features. Price times quantity, total cost. We may also be doing things that are specific to our models. For example, if you're using a neural network, you probably want to balance the total number of dogs that you give to the total number of cat samples that you give. You might create a function that will allow you to create batches with equal samples. And lastly, you might be wrapping certain machine learning libraries. For example, if you're using something like TensorFlow, you might want to be able to easily configure the architecture that you're kind of going through instead of always copy-pasting, add a layer here, add a node there. Now, this brings a certain number of advantages for us. The obvious one, it ensures that the cleaning process is actually doing what we think it's doing. We want to make sure that when we're replacing certain values with certain things, for example, that it's actually doing that especially if that function is rather complex. It also allows us to help uh, to split the code. In order to test the unit, you have to extract that functionality into its own function. That means that you're having a well-named function, which makes it more readable and maintainable for your team members. After all, you are working in a team. That also leads me to the fact that it documents 
the cleaning process. Not just by having well-named functions and actually making your code readable, but also by documenting the expectations. Each test is going to be checking a certain scenario. So the next person can go into the code and actually understand what your intentions were with a piece of code. And lastly, it helps you debugging. If some data comes into your pipeline in production and suddenly everything breaks, you can reproduce this bug in order to fix it. You can create a test that takes this as an input, calls the function that broke, and then you can write what you expect it to do. This test will fail at first because you're reproducing the issue. But once that test passes, then you have the confidence that you have actually fixed the bug without having to deploy 100 times and check whether it works in production. The next level of the pyramid is integration testing. These are the tests that we write to make sure that everything connects together. When you bring all those units that you have wonderfully tested with your unit tests together, you might be bringing them in a different order than you originally expected. The outputs of certain functions become the inputs of other functions. So there's a lot of room for error. By creating tests that go from one end to the other, you can ensure that your data cleaning process is actually resulting in the data that you want to feed your model. Not just each small function, but the actual whole data pipeline is resulting in what you want the model to be receiving as the input. It also ensures that you can actually fit that data into the model, unlike the set that doesn't fit in there. If you have, for example, your data cleaning process that's outputting five features generally, and your architecture for a neural network, for example, that expects five inputs, if your data cleaning suddenly outputs six features, things are going to break. And you want to catch that early. And lastly, but actually my favorite bit, is it helps you refactor. You're probably experimenting. You're probably not experimenting in production. You're probably experimenting within your local machine, trying different things until you have a model that you're confident you want to bring to production. Once you want to do this, you need to kind of start splitting things up because you're going to end up with this chunk of code, most likely. And when you bring it into production, you want to make your code maintainable so that your team can actually work on it. You also want to take out reusable things and so on. But you also don't want to break this wonderful magical model you've just created. So you can create an end-to-end -end test that gives you that little bit more of confidence that you can actually start splitting things up without breaking it. But it's stochastic, you say. Well, we have seeding. And in order to actually help you refactor, a test that seeds your model is actually useful. Because you can actually make sure, or at least have a little bit more confidence, that you're not breaking things when you're cleaning things up. Now you have this model. You have graphs on one side. You have accuracies through the roof, wonderful colors. But if it doesn't work for your user, it's useless. Your model is not the product. Your model is an input to the product, most likely an input to a set of business rules that then finally provide value to the user. A use case validation test will involve taking data through your trained model, taking the outputs of that, putting them through your business rules, and only then checking what the value is that we're giving to the user, that it is what we actually expect. This ensures that we're actually solving the problem that the user needs solved. It also documents the decisions that have happened around the model. By keeping these decisions close to the model, any new data scientist that comes in will be able to understand what the impact will be on the product. Because teams change. The people that made those decisions have probably left, have joined another team. People have rotated. So in order to not lose those decisions, having this kind of test is very useful because it's documented then in code. 
You can also make this kind of test part of your uh, CI pipeline. It can allow you to decide whether a model is better than the other in order to push the one to production. And it will check that this model is better than the other based on the value for the user and not just on things like F1 scores, accuracies, etc. And lastly, it provides visibility. It's a kind of test that your product manager understands. The kind of test that your client understands. You can use the information that you're getting from this kind of test in order to provide visibility to all your stakeholders about the progress and the status of the machine learning features at the moment. Now, your model will go into the wild after all of this and face its worst enemy, the real world. Once it does this, you want to have some sort of monitoring in place in order to check how it's doing in the real world and in order to decide whether you need to change certain things or not. That in itself can be a talk as well, so I'm not going to go into it, but it is definitely worth mentioning that, this is, that your testing doesn't stop here. I want you to take two things away from this talk. One, machine learning is still software. I wanted to make you repeat that after me, but I don't think it's going to work. And two, if you have the skill set to write the code for the model, you have the skill set to write the test. It's OK if you've never done it before. Sit down with someone that has. I can assure you that one of the engineers in your team has done it. After all, magic is just science that we don't understand yet. And today, you understand testing. Feel free to get in touch with me. Chat to me at the conference. I don't bite. He might, but he's not here today. Thank you very much.